Um, okay, I others are are bound to to come here, um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. Um, I gave uh, a uh, quicker paced version of this presentation, but it still took 30, 35 minutes during the uh, ESDA board meeting last week. And the board members requested that uh, we spend more time on it. And I felt that it, it merited more of a community conversation with key stakeholders. Uh, so there we have uh, an extended list of folks who have been invited to participate in this uh, presentation. The purpose of it is that Sound Transit um, is currently going through the initial phases of its environmental work for the Everett Link extension. Just quick background, um, it plans to target date for opening is 2037 for light rail to downtown Everett with uh, a schedule that they have funding to build up by 2041. Um, so there is a funding gap for the 2037 opening date. And that uh, through about 2036, um, they're doing planning work of figuring out uh, exactly what alignments they're gonna be building. And so um, in this year, they are scoping the potential alternatives uh, that they will analyze through the environmental analysis moving forward. And so they, they are scoping you know, what will be the preferred option of alignment and station locations, and then um, also the other options that they'll have as kind of backups uh, as they go forward. There's a critical point right now uh, where the agency is taking public comment moving. And the next step is a lot of those alignments and station locations that they're gonna be considering for further analysis are gonna be pretty locked in. And so we wanna make sure that the agency is thinking about all of the issues and has the right alignments and station locations on the table. Um, so with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, the, the presentation. Um, I will pause throughout uh, after brief sections to do Q&A um, and for comment um, so you can engage as we go. Um, so quickly, I'm gonna go over what I just said again. Um, so uh, light rail to downtown Everett was approved in 2016 uh, for funding. Um, with it being built by 2036 last year, uh, due to financial constraints, the Sound Transit Board set a new target date of 2037 with the affordable schedule of 2041. We are starting the planning work, officially started last year, but this is the first full year of uh, doing full uh, scoping. Um, there are three different bodies that are reviewing the agency's work. The first level has been meeting for uh, quite a while now, it's the interagency group of staff level folks uh, from the cities and the and transit agencies reviewing work. Uh, the next is an elected leadership group. Uh, and then the final piece is a community advisory group. And so those are the bodies that are weighing in. And uh, for so that's the next step. Um, within this is a little triangle from the agency highlighting uh, this year's level of work. So they've done initial screening November, December of the initial alternatives uh, that they wanted to look at. Uh, for the past couple of months, they've been what they call level one. Uh, so you can see where we're at. We're quickly going to be into level two. And this is the critical juncture at which uh, we're going to be um, really figuring out which alternatives to move forward on. So they're looking at the whole Everett Link extension from Mariner Park and Ride in the south uh, up through the Southwest Everett Industrial Center and then to our neighborhood. Um, so these are kind of all the different options that they're looking at of different alignments and station locations. Uh, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive of one another in terms of alignments and station locations. And here are the locations and alignments for Everett, the Everett Station District itself. Uh, so um, on the left is, it goes D, C, B, A. Um, a is the, rec is the representative alignment that's within the ST3 package uh, that was passed in 2016 and is the basis for the initial cost estimates for the project. Um, 
And then C is what the city of Everett established as its preferred location for the link extension as part of uh, the Metro Everett plan adopted in 2018. Um, B and D are kind of iterations of, of C and the other thoughts. So before we get going, I wanna ground us in kind of what I think is a good representative of what of how our neighborhood might change. Um, and that's the Bellevue Spring District in the Bell Red Corridor. So in 2008, uh, the region passed SD2 or Sound Move, the ballot measure to extend light rail to Bellevue and, and Microsoft. Uh, the Bell Red Corridor is the 120th and 130th stations in Bellevue. Um, the 120th is called the Spring District. Um, uh, this is what uh, the neighborhood looked a few years ago, black and white. Uh, in the uh, foreground is the Spring District, is mostly a distribution center. And then in the farther out, you can see downtown Bellevue. Um, the, the Spring District has been historically a light industrial area or distribution center. And so like our neighborhood, it shares a lot of characteristics with our neighborhood in that sense, uh, with the downtown being a little ways away. In this case, uh, a couple miles away, a mile and a half or so. This is uh, the Spring District today in the foreground, uh, a year, about a year or two ago. Um, so how did they get here? Uh, well, they first had a plan of what it would look like. Um, and, you know, they mapped out where land uses would be. They took a proactive approach for real estate development. Um, and you can see in that orange area of the map here, that's where the future light rail would go through and where it's constructed now. Um, it opens next year in 2024. And so between uh, the start of their planning work in 2024 is, uh, is uh, all the work that came through. So a lot of evolution of how they got there. Here's the spring district in uh, 2002. Uh, this is roughly the planning area. Um, from north to south is about uh, a quarter mile. And I got to let a couple of people in. Luckily, they've seen the presentation already. Okay. Um, in 2009, uh, the Bell, there was a Bell Red Quarter Project Steering Committee that published its recommendations for redeveloping the neighborhood. Uh, that was in 2007. Uh, in 2009, uh, the city of Bellevue adopted the Bell Red sub area plan and zoning code uh, to implement it. Um, and in 2008, the voters had passed the SD2 ballot measure. So, you know, all in the 2007, 2009 timeframe. 2015, um, the, the city adopted a streetscape plan for the Bell Red area. Uh, 2016, the city adopted a parks plan for the neighborhood and the voters passed the SD3 ballot measure, um, which would extend light rail for them to downtown, uh, downtown Redmond from Microsoft. 2017, um, uh, following that planning work, uh, Sparks Apartments opens with 309 market rate units and a 14,000 square foot childcare facility and playground. City of Bellevue uh, sought and was awarded a $100 million TIFIA loan for bike walk and stormwater improvements. And Microsoft and UW established a partnership with the Chinese University to open up the Global Innovation Exchange in the Spring District. All these things were not established when they started their planning work, but were subsequent to the planning work and the establishment of, of securing funding for light rail. In 2018, Ares Apartments opened with uh, 279 market rate units and a bike club. Um, you can see that the light rail station is, start, is uh, starting to be constructed on the north end of uh, the neighborhood there. 29, uh, 2020, um, Amelia Apartments opens with 204 market rate units in a community DIY workshop. Lario Town Homes opens with 46 market rate homes. Uh, although REI was initially slated to, to be the primary commercial or office tenant in the neighborhood uh, that changed to being Facebook and Facebook opened into a 11 floor building. Um, one more person to admit. Um, 
with ground floor retail and a brew pub opened in 2020. In 2021, Facebook opened another building with nine floors and ground floor retail. Um, in 2023, so this is 2022. This is uh, a satellite image taken just uh, like a month ago uh, that's on Google. Um, so you can see it's pretty much fully built out. Uh, light rail still needs to be completed of the station. Um, and then the pink area is Sound Transit is doing its own transit-oriented development to the north uh, west of the site. Um, all of this is within a quarter mile of the station. So the light rail opens up next year. Um, and uh, I, you know, I think there's a bunch of things happening here uh, in terms of that, that's really applicable to what we are about. Um, you can also see the rest of the neighborhood remains pretty much the same in terms of the distribution center, uh, distribution centers and light industrial uses uh, to the east of the site. Um, the, uh, there is a real estate firm that is actively trying to, uh, you know, get tenants uh, and develop the site. And so they have a web page that kind of highlights this. Uh, this is a, an image of the development of a mix of the 3D renderings plus the existing buildings. Um, so you can get a look of kind of what it, what it is and will be. Another angle and another angle. And I'm going to, this is, the site is really cool to look at, uh, the website. So I'm gonna drop it in the chat for folks if you wanna check it out on your own time um, here. Uh, so you can get a sense of their development. And on the ground, here's a, a few um, street view photos of the existing buildings today. So I think that's a good uh, representation of kind of how our neighborhood could change and thinking of it being targeted over time and, and the prospect of light rail. Um, I'm gonna go over a couple of the plans and how they match into our work. Um, there's been a lot of plans over time and this is just a quick, you know, as you look at the pink there, the city did a, a plan for the neighborhood in 2005, in 2015 allowed for residential development 2018 adopted the Metro Everett plan. Um, ESDA has been doing, you know, visioning work in 2017, 2020, 2021. Um, and so our last one, which was last year with the convergence study, we looked at uh, the potential of the city properties and what could be done with them. Um, so on the left is the parking lot, on the right is the uh, Everett public work site. And you know, I think this is a lot like what happened in the Spring District in terms of development. And I bring this up because, um, well, just to note that this is a lot like the Spring District uh, in that we can take a focused approach towards the, the light rail coming. In both of our 2020 plan and 2021 plan, we made sure to uh, really emphasize that we really do prioritize, do value and prioritize our light industrial and other related commercial uses um, and designating the area south of 33rd Street as being uh, places where we want to enhance uh, those existing activities. And in both plans, we highlighted uh, the importance of freight routes going through, which is an important consideration as we move into the alignment discussion of the light rail. So, um, uh, just recapping again with the uh, um, environmental scoping that we're in currently. Um, again, we're at level one going to level two. Uh, what we're looking for today is I'm just trying to inform the participants here of what um, all the considerations and then have a discussion of what those, it, what potential issues there might be. Um, I am not looking for us to be of uniform opinion or for ESDA to take a position of saying, we want this station to be an X location. There's still a ton more information that we'll get out of this environmental uh, alternatives work from Sound Transit. So what we want is to be able to tell Sound Transit, you know, here are all the potential issues, have the agency do their work, and then they come back to us with all of the information so that way we can make an informed decision to, to let them know what we think would be best for the community. That said, uh, another part of this is we wanna empower you to weigh in with the agency itself. 
So if you do have a preferred lo uh, station location, you know, at least you're informed through this presentation to be able to make an individual decision to weigh in as to what your preference is. Um, so again, here are the options here, D, C, B, A. Um, so here is D running up Broadway um, with the station location near uh, Hewitt and Broadway. Here is C, which is the city's preferred route uh, running up McDougal and then a station in the block of uh, between 32nd and Pacific. And here is B, which is running up McDougal, but in the street and over the top of 32nd Street. Here's A, which is the uh, representative alignment including the ST3 package, uh, slightly modified in that the station uh, currently shown in the current documents is basically where the Swift bus stop is. And then we'll talk a little bit about another option that would be on the east side of the tracks uh, that is not currently being evaluated. Any of these alternatives work well with our 2021 plan um, or 2021 uh, convergence study. Uh, we looked at three potential locations of where the light rail station might be within that, um, uh, that report. Uh, uh, the city's preferred location, the representative alignment, as well as the option that's not currently being evaluated right now of having light rail station on the east side of the tracks. And in terms of activation, uh, catalyzing development, station location, uh, it is all pretty equivalent to one another, um, but there's some caveats to that, which we'll discuss later. And the other thing is, is you know, big part of our 2020 plan and 2021 plan is the idea of uh, having a, a neighborhood town gathering space. We have very few public parks. We have a very few ways of really having people enjoy the outdoors in our neighborhood, of having placemaking. And so we've included the concept of um, turning 32nd Street into a pedestrian focused street. And any of the uh, plans, again, uh, any of the potential alignments would work well with having pedestrians 32nd Street. Our 2020 plan had some renderings of what that might look like on 32nd Street. So I'm just gonna flip through these a little bit. And this. So, uh, you know, just kind of thematically different ideas of what, what could be happening there. But regardless of where the station is, it's still an important 32nd Street remains either an important connection between tr two transit stations or as an important connection from both the light rail station and Everett station towards downtown. Um, so I'm going to pause there. And then the next step is we're going to go through kind of uh, different uh, elements of the uh, kind of analyze potential issues with the different alignments. But um, before I move on, I just want to take a moment to see if there's any questions about the process that Sound Transit is going through, kind of their timeline, um, or maybe some questions about uh, our reports uh, from the past. Brock, can you go over the, their timeline of decision making for the stop? Like you said, there's there's more analysis to be done on there and before. Like when is the decision going to be made? Yeah, so it's a um, there's is an iterative process uh, that builds teams as it goes. Um, so by the end of this year, beginning of next year, the agency will have picked a preferred alternative for station locations and alignment. Um, and then with that will also be uh, a selection of alternatives that it will also analyze as part of an environmental analysis. I got the sense from Sound Transit last week that they're still, they're hoping that they don't have to do a full EIS uh, a federal EIS, they would still be required to do a state uh, EIS, um, but I, I don't see how they're getting around it. So for the sake of, of clarity, for the sake of just uh, simplification, you know, I expect that there'll be an EIS and they'll have to bring this through the full uh, alternatives analysis of an EIS. 
And so once they have that uh, set of their alternatives that they're proceeding forward on and the preferred alternative, they will move that through the full EIS process, um, which means they will continue to do all of the other due diligence that comes within, within EIS. Final decision for um, whether to, the decision point for moving from this planning phase into design work and engineering work is in 2036. So, uh, but what is important right now is to make sure that there's, they're starting to, to do the right analysis on the different alternatives um, and that they're including all the alternatives we think are important. Um, so that's the, the critical point right now. Is that helpful? Absolutely. Okay. Rock, I had a question about um, underground elevated versus ground level. Do we know anything about that? for any of these alternatives? Yeah, so what the next part of the presentation, we'll go through that uh, okay. in terms of those. Yep. Um, yep. Okay. I, okay. I'm gonna go to the next step here. The thing as we go through this process, I just want you to think about, uh, think of vehicular traffic impacts or lane capacity reduction. Uh, freight and delivery truck operations on certain streets, um, noise, shadows, views, how those how that might affect development, uh, the need to remove power lines or, or put power lines in different places. Um, frankly, all alternatives will require some movement of, of power lines. Uh, and then, you know, on the, the other side of the opportunity to catalyze development, uh, increase pedestrian volumes on the street, improve transit. I'm sure there's a number of other things to think about as well. I just want you to, to think of, you know, be queued up to be thinking about all these things and others. So I'm gonna walk through um, the impact of the elevated structure uh, of just kind of to help you think of what that might be. Um, the city's, uh, city of Everett's preferred location design of a station. Uh, so show some of their renderings. We have our own renderings that uh, our own staff have done, so you can get a, a little bit better grasp of what it might look like. Um, there's a, an option that's not currently on the table that I'm calling option X um, that I just wanna walk through with you uh, that uh, could be an alternative that folks may request to have that Sound Transit look at. And then finally, uh, a developable lands analysis uh, of the, the properties are within a walking distance. We'll summarize, discuss, uh, and then if we have time, potentially discuss uh, other issues of alignment to the south. So first impact of the elevated structure. Uh, so uh, all four of these would have some element of being elevated at some point. Um, so that means it would be on pillars, and the rail would be above you. Uh, Broadway, McDougal uh, alignments of B, C, and D would definitely be elevated. Uh, there's a potential for option A to end up on the ground, uh, but uh, it certainly would start elevated as it comes into the neighborhood. Um, so this is what an elevated structure looks like. This is just south of um, the Angle Lake Station, south of SeaTac. Um, so I'm gonna flip through some photos so you get a sense of what it looks like. Obviously it has different heights depending on, it, uh, the rail needs to stay pretty level so it's not going up and down as much as the road. Um, you can see here that the, uh, uh, it is not taking up a ton of side, the sidewalk is pretty wide, but it's not taking up a ton of sidewalk space on the ground. Uh, up above, it is taking up uh, more space than, uh, than just the sidewalk width. So that, those were photos from Angle Lake, or coming into Angle Lake. Um, I'm gonna show some photos of the Northgate station because uh, this helps, I think, uh, 
show what the station in EBRA is most likely to look like. Um, so this is elevated track coming into Northgate uh, to the south and towards downtown is to the left of this photo. Um, we're looking at the east side of the, the station. At the ground level is just bus bays uh, and other pickup drop off uh, for transit around the state around the station. And the intended design in Everett would be similar to this. Um, there is a mezzanine level in between, which connects to a pedestrian bridge that goes over I-5. And then there's the third level where people board onto the, to the train. Uh, this is a little zoomed in. This is from the ground. This is from the pedestrian bridge that goes over I-5. Uh, so looking towards the west side of the station and from below from the west side. Let's give the, a sense of the station itself. Now, uh, coming into the station, uh, the station is a center platform, which means the tracks are on either side of, of the, the center platform up above. And that means the overhead um, structure has to be much larger um, as it comes in because the tracks are splitting as it comes into the station. So as it's going over First Avenue here, you can see that it is, is quite wide and much larger in presence. Um, so you can imagine the, the visual aspect of this on the, on the landscape as it comes into the station. Um, this, so the previous photo was looking from the north towards the south. This is from the south looking towards the north towards the station. Um, So that's the uh, that's kind of the physical aspect. And again, um, here are the station locations uh, and options D, C, B, and probably most of A would all be elevated. Um, the this drawing is from Sound Transit. It shows currently is showing the alignment on Broadway to be taking up some of the, the buildings. I doubt that's actually what would be happening. Uh, there is the possibility would in fact be in the median of Broadway. Um, so there's still some things to be determined in terms of, of what that would look like. Um, so here is uh, Broadway. Uh, this is looking south from at the Angel of the Winds Arena uh, at Hewitt. You can imagine where the elevated structure would be either on the east side of the street or in the center turn lane of just, you kind of have to imagine it, but <laughs> requesting you do that. Um, there's also the, the power lines there on the east, east side of the street that would need to be removed um, or moved. Same block looking north. So imagine the, uh, the structure in the middle of the street or on the east side of the street. Uh, also imagine what that structure might be uh, running along the buildings uh, along Broadway. Uh, if it's, you know, two, three, four floors up uh, and the visual impact that might have, um, possibly the sound impact. Um, same here with the Hopewick station. Next is uh, options. Um, B and C, uh, which have a McDougal alignment. And so I just want to, again, think about the elevated structure and what that might be coming up McDougal. The station uh, on option C would be basically Evergreen State heat and air conditioning, and then to the south to the United Way building, which is the orange building behind the trees. Um, so that's where the station would be under the city's preferred location. Um, again, think about the elevated structure for the south and also the potential freight impacts uh, south of 33rd Street. Um, we have a lot of distribution buildings uh, and other light industrial users. Uh, and again, there is some power lines uh, on McDougal as well, some significant ones. Here's an image for Joe on the phone call, uh, Everett Storage. Okay, so that's the McDougal alignment. Thank you, Brock. 
Yep. Um, and then uh, this photo here, I'm going to show some images of, of Streetscape just for you to imagine uh, this. This is where the light rail station would be under option A, uh, which is a swift bus stop. Um, the alignment uh, would likely come uh, to the east of the street through the property. And that's because the city of Everett owns most of that property. Uh, what it doesn't own is Hanson Towing. So uh, it doesn't need to come up the street. It could come through the property and come directly to the station. And so that's just something to think about that generally it would avoid uh, the Nysetters uh, Sea Dog uh, properties. Um, let's pause there and see if folks have any comments in terms of uh, kind of impact of freight or traffic or sound or moving of power lines, those sorts of issues. Yeah, hey, Brock. Yep. I think the, uh, you know, the route down McDougal, um, earlier you said that they wanted to maintain the commercial industrial area south of 33rd, which makes sense. But uh, I think as long as it was an elevated track coming down McDougal, um, it would probably work. It would work for us, I think. Yeah. That's all. OK, that's good to know. Um, let me, I think it can, I'm going to flip back a bit. And I'm sorry for flipping so much, but. Um, I think it's helpful to think about in terms of freight impact, you know, how far apart those pillars would be. Um, and so I'm putting this image up so you can see, you know, they're about every 50 to 75 feet, something like that, uh, apart from one another. So the question would be, can they be put in locations where, where you, it is not impacting coming in and out of the, the buildings? Yeah, as long as they didn't put one right in front of one of our big roll up doors, it would be all right. Yeah. Brock, uh, what is the construction time from start to finish? How, how long, let's say they pick McDougal, how long would McDougal be unusable? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know the or answer to that. Mystery, whatever, I, that is something that we should get um, found out from uh, Sound Transit is, is what is that period of time? That, that's definitely a good thing to make sure that they're providing an answer on for us. Yeah, and then, in Linwood, the interruption time was about two and a half years. I, I have some acquaintances that have properties down there that. Uh... Yeah. Anyway. Yep. And that, you know, there's a difference in terms of what the construction type is and how it's interfacing with the, the street users in terms of how much time it's going to take up. So. Yeah, let's make sure Sound Transit answers that question. Have, okay. they, have they pinned down the east or west side of the options? No. Okay. No. Brock, the other thing uh, that you did, uh, if you could clarify, when you showed uh, from north to south on McDougal from Pacific, uh, is, is that a structure on uh, Pacific um, uh, with all three alternatives? Will it be flattened out instead of coming down to McDougal and back up? Uh, we'll go over that in the next uh, section here. Um, okay. But um, I, yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm going to jump to the next section. So um, I, just like I'm presenting Sound Transit's work, uh, here I'm presenting the city's work. I should give a caveat, you know, I'm not either the city or the transit agency. And so I'm representing other people's work and um, uh, take that with a bit of grain of salt. So in 2015, um, the city, uh, I want to make sure I got that right. Yeah, 2015, the city convened an, uh, in, an internal uh, agency charrette to uh, think about what their where their preferred location of a light rail station would be. 
um, and then what the design and operations might be and came up with a pretty sophisticated plan for what it is. And that got baked into the Metro Everett plan adopted in 2018 and now is part of the city's comprehensive plan as the city's preferred location. I'm not gonna go into this rendering. This rendering is seen in many of the planning documents. Um, I think this rendering is probably one of the most useful. Um, it shows how the alignment is coming up McDougal from the, the bottom right here uh, is the south end coming up McDougal, swerving into a block, uh, and then coming into the block that is uh, 32nd to Pacific um, along McDougal. What I'll say is these renderings show the station going in the middle of the block. Subsequent conversations after the renderings were done, my understanding is the city is generally would prefer the station to be directly on McDougal and not in the middle of the block because putting in the middle limits the transit-oriented development potential on the Broadway side. Um, but this is what the renderings show and also what the uh, what Sound Transit shows in their um, in, in their current work. So uh, it is an elevated structure comes in. And then as Greg was mentioning, uh, the uh, Pacific becomes grade separated from McDougal. And so, oh, I see, oh, I have somebody in the chat. Um, that the grade separating of, uh, of McDougal and Pacific is a city priority and not baked into any sound transit uh, plans for the station. And so this would be something that would probably need to be funded through outside sources, um, not through Sound Transit itself, but would be collaboratively worked on between the city and the agency. That's just, I think, the, the, the general understanding at this point. Um, it is an important thing, though, uh, for this station to work, because a big concept with the station is really a, a new way of how all the transit uh, interacts with one another at this site. McDougal between 32nd and Pacific would become a local, it'd become a bus priority street um, with that's very focused on local transit. Pacific would become also, would also have significant uh, bus uh, prioritization, especially for the community transit Swift line. And then there's of course, above that, the light rail station. So there's three layers of transit here having really close uh, interconnectivity. Um, it also, by uh, separating McDougal and Pacific, uh, makes traffic operations so much easier there for somebody who's trying to uh, get north on, on McDougal. Um, you don't have to be at that uh, no man's land of, of a stop. So uh, next image, just another angle at it. So this is looking from the north to the south of a cross section of the station. Again, you can see the grade separation of Pacific and McDougal with the light rail station above um, and see how the transit interacts. Again, this rendering was made before the conversation of moving the station closer to McDougal and not in the middle of the block, but you get a sense of how it would work. And one more cross section showing the same thing. Okay. Um, Brock, sorry, yep. is there, do you have any idea um, from any of this where the where the parking is? So um, the the parking um, is a separate line item within the Sound Transit three package, and so is not part of this project. It is a different project for a hundred stall parking garage to be built by under the new time frame twenty forty six. And under the city's preferred option, the parking garage would be built on the Sound Transit parking lot that currently exists on the east side, uh, on the east side parking lot. So that's the envision. Who's going to use the the Everett Station? Okay. Uh, yeah. So the the hope the, the hope here is for uh, obviously lots of transit-oriented development and new residents living in the neighborhood and then folks walking from downtown using it, and then the interconnectivity of the transit lines of being able, people commuting from, by bus from Lake Stevens into the station uh, and, and things like that to, in, to connect towards the light rail. That's a big change from the mentality of most of the people in Snohomish County. Yeah. 
Okay, we're um, okay. So those are that's the render, that's the city's rendering. Um, I'm gonna walk through three illustrations made by uh, our ESDA Vista member um, Jennifer Cow, who's unfortunately at another meeting at the moment, so is unable to flip through this for you. Um, and this is going to include an option X here, which is not currently being evaluated by Sound Transit. So again, here's the, the locations. This is going to cover option C, A, and X. So again, this is uh, the city's preferred alternative, uh, looking at what exactly what we just looked at from the uh, northeast towards the southwest at the station of the grade separation of uh, McDougal and uh, in Pacific with this station above. Um, this is just a same angle or close to the same angle, um, slightly different rendering. This is from the, the ground uh, from the, the north uh, looking south and from the south looking north. All right, this is option A. Um, now we didn't know exactly where the station would land when Jennifer created this rendering. So it's slightly different than the, what the agency put out. Um, but you can see the alignment coming from the south on the, on the right side of the screen towards, uh, and then moving towards the north um, along I-5 and then through the, uh, through the property. Um, and then, the the current version that the agency has, it would have it would land in that southern park, not parking lot, but it looks like a parking lot, uh, which is a Swift bus stop. Uh, in our rendering, we have it coming onto the ground because it could, and that would likely be cheaper. But it could be elevated. The station could also be elevated. Another angle. Uh, this is a view. Uh, just from this directly from the south looking north. Looking from the east side of the tracks to the west side of the tracks. Okay, so that's the, that was option A. And this is option X. So not, this is not an option being considered by the agency currently, uh, but it would, this alignment would come on the east side of the tracks. Uh, of the existing BNSF tracks, and then go up. Um, there's two large parcels. Uh, one Sound Transit owns, which is where the light rail station in this rendering would be. And then on the to the south of it is a property that's owned by Everett Steel and BNSF uh, that recently had a brownfield cleanup. Um, so it's a fairly simple property acquisition on that side of things. Right, I think those are all the renderings for that location. Um, any questions about those three renderings before we talk about option X in a little bit more detail? Okay. Next, um, I'm going to diagram an option uh, that uh, is a little bit more fully fleshed idea that was in ESDA's 2020 report and our 2021 report. It was in both as a potential uh, because we thought the property acquisition was so simple on the east side, the agency would be inclined to include it in the study no matter what. So we wanted to be thinking ahead. Um, the, I'm providing a little bit more detail because um, our consultant who helped put together the report for the 2021 report, the convergence study, uh, had a really innovative idea for dealing with some of the parking loss that might come with the development of the, the parking lot in front of Everett Station. 
um, and also connecting the east and west sides of the tracks so that it's a little bit more, but so you can walk between both sides and bike between both sides more easily. And so I'm going to walk through this rendering here. So you can see the station in this concept is actually straddling underneath the Pacific Avenue Bridge. Uh, there should be enough headroom for this. Um, and so this would allow people potentially to go up from the station via elevator or stairs to Pacific and then walk on Pacific towards downtown. And if you're coming up on the north side of Pacific, then that's a fairly, you shorten your walk pretty significantly to get to downtown that way. Um, the concept from the consultant was to, to put a parking garage uh, in the staff parking lot to the north of Everett Station. And so it could be a tiered parking garage and then it could come flush with the Smith Avenue ramp that comes up to Pacific. So it would be kind of a, a tiered uh, wedding cake type parking garage. The next big idea from the consultant was to put a lid over the top of the parking garage such that you could have a, uh, a bit more of a, a walking a more pleasant walking biking experience to get uh, from one side to the other side of the tracks. And uh, it would also mean that the sidewalks are pretty narrow on Pacific and so it would be a limiting factor uh, for any of the, the station options in terms of trying to catalyze development on the east side of the tracks or the west side of the tracks depending where the light rail station would be. So this would help address that issue by making it a much more pleasant experience to get from one side to the other. And then finally, just like the city's concept, Pacific could also be prioritized for, for bus buses. So you have the direct connections between the bus service and the light rail, where somebody could come up from the light rail and then go on to Pacific and catch the bus to where they need to go. And so in our 2020 report, we had thought about that actually, drew up this alignment uh, and then thought about the bus service network of how it could be uh, uh, realigned uh, to really uh, prioritize those connections. So that was our option X uh, that we have thought about at different levels over the last few years and is not currently being evaluated by Sound Transit. Um, any any questions about this rendering or diagram? What, what, what are we doing with option X? Are we proposing it uh, to the city and to Sound Transit or not? Um, we, uh, well, so first off, the purpose of this meeting is simply to hear everybody's concerns and feedback and so uh, for from ESDA's perspective so that way we can be informed in, in raising those concerns and feedback to the agency. And then the other is to inform you as to uh, in the participants here for what direct feedback you'd like to make back to the agency itself. So if you want to really be gung ho about a particular station, you can be gung ho about a station. We, and there was a previous round of public comment that was provided in early scoping. Uh, ESDA provided uh, our list of things for the agency to consider. And one of those things was to think about cost savings by having uh, the option X alignment be one of the alternatives to evaluate. Uh, not that we were saying you should definitely go build it, but that it should be part of the evaluation process or the uh, analytical process. And so that is as much as we've uh, put out the idea in terms of uh, this so far. Thank you. Yep. Is there a significant cost difference between the options? You know, we, we really don't know uh, the answer to that question. Um, my my gut feeling initially had been, you know, uh, the property acquisition of a single property to build a light rail station on the east side is a probably going to be fairly uh, affordable way to go, and that's why, you know, east side, uh, east of the tracks alignment made sense to me to include within that analysis. 
Um, but there's other considerations with it, like uh, just the alignment along I-5 and potential, you know, it's gonna have to closely go over between and over Greg's property as it goes along I-5 and along Northwest Zoological Supply and a couple of the other properties. And that's a fairly constrained space between um, the freeway space and uh, the private property. And so, you know, I don't know if there's cost issues with the uh, geoengineering that would have to be done there. Um, with the McDougal and Broadway alignments, you know, if, if as shown on their uh, alignments, they're actually taking property that uh, instead of using the street right of way, uh, that's going to be very expensive. If they are using the street right of way, they still have to compensate the city for that. Uh, and then they will also, and all these alternatives have to move major power lines. Um, so all those things add cost. And uh, I think that's one of the things we're looking forward to in the future is, you know, the cost estimates of the alignments. Hey, Brock, on that uh, option X, uh, do we know if there's a lot of power lines that would need to be moved and things? Because that makes, to me, that route makes a lot of good sense. Um, I do believe there is one that uh, major, um, and I know the PUD is on the line, uh, but there is a major power line coming from the east into the neighborhood, into the substation. And at any of the alignments, I think, ultimately have to cross that power line at some form, uh, regardless. Uh, it's either coming out of the substation or going into the substation. And so uh, that is just uh, something that has to be addressed. There's fewer time, there's, there would only be one crossing though on the east of the, of the substation where on the west side, the, there's all sorts of more lines that have to be dealt with. I see Alex Ch uh, from the PUD came on, yep. so. Yep. <laughs> hey guys, uh, yeah, in general, from the PUD perspective, uh, anything um, over near the tracks, option X or uh, option D is kind of standard uh, impacts to us. We can mitigate those. Uh, anything running right along McDougal is going to be tougher. We've got a substation right there. So coming along McDougal impacts every one of the circuits that's going in to feed this area of Everett. Um, not undoable, but the impacts to us are far more significant. Thanks, Alex. That's helpful. Brock, I have a question. It's Marianne. Hi, Marianne. Oh, hi. Apologies for being late. Um, did you mention, are the options listed in order that they are desired? So A is the first option, B is the second? There, there is no stated desire by any part, by ESBA at this point. Um, okay. By uh, the agency for sure does not have a preferred, uh, I mean, doesn't have at least publicly a preferred option. The city of Everett does have a preferred option that's stated in the Metro Everett plan adopted in 2018, which is option C. Um, option A is the representative alignment that was included within the ST3 package. Uh, that does not mean it's preferred by the agency, it's just the one that they use for cost estimates. Okay, thank you. Okay, so lastly, um, I'm gonna cover you know, a big hope here is that we're going to be catalyzing development uh, in terms of uh, we know that there's um, uh, a lot of people <laughs> that are going to either be born or moving to the region and that we have regional policies that in order to ensure that people can easily get around that these new people generally live closer to the light rail stations um, as their primary way of getting around. And so, uh, and then as property owners here uh, that are uh, looking for long-term investment, certainly uh, I'm sure you're hopeful for that development for those who are uh, light industrial users uh, or, or business owners, you might be more hesitant about it. But uh, I wanted to provide an analysis of the potential developable area or properties that are within a walking distance of the stations. And just to keep it simple, I'm only going to look at uh, option C, which is the city's preferred location, and option X. Um, 
and just kind of highlight the, the total developable uh, land uh, within those two station areas. This is going to be a half mile, sorry, a quarter mile radius, which is uh, generally a five to 10 minute walk. It also happens to be the total distance for the spring district distance of how of all the spring district is within a quarter mile. So this is option C, the preferred location. Um, uh, right away, there are properties that are undevelopable because of the alignment um, as, as shown currently. And uh, that's because the alignment would go into the block along McDougall. And so uh, you lose five blocks to, or half five half blocks to development uh, just off the top because of the alignment itself. There are a fair number of uh, public agency properties throughout the, the neighborhood and we would expect those to not be developed. And so I've marked those in black here. And you know, per every station district alliances commitment towards our light industrial users, there are some properties within the, the district that are also uh, prioritized for not to be developed as well. Uh, so that's Everett Steel over there on the east side. Um, and then there's some development that's happening anyways, and we don't expect them to be redeveloped as a result of the light rail within this time frame. And so you have Compass Health and uh, Housing Hopes development, uh, the recent Connect Apartments. So that leaves the remaining properties. Um, the dark green on the upper half of the circle uh, is zoned up to 25 floors. The middle uh, shade of green in the middle of the, the, uh, the circle is up to 11 floors. And then the light green is up to three floors in the uh, southeast corner of the circle. Now there is a significant hill. Um, and so that does reduce the walkable uh, properties. And to get to the low site, um, it is about a quarter mile walk just from the station to the entry ramp to um, Lowe's. And so most of Lowe's is actually not within a walkable area. Uh, to the station. So between those two factors uh, is a significant reduction in terms of the, the walkable, developable properties. Going, so just a cleaner look at that. Okay, now looking at option X, um, so some public properties, uh, the alignment is obviously not taking up any blocks that we would expect to be developed. So that's helpful, uh, but fewer uh, public properties uh, within the area that uh, are unlikely to be developed. And then there is Everett Steel more centered in this circle. Um, and then uh, we, Kaiser Permanente is redeveloping their block. We wouldn't expect the light rail to uh, uh, encourage it uh, or to have it redevelop again. Um, and I don't really expect the hotel to redevelop. Uh, so there's two properties that wouldn't likely be redeveloped as a result of this, but they are important ones to connect to uh, regardless. Um, and that leaves the remaining properties uh, here to, that would be developable. And again, the low site uh, is up to 25 floors. And then to the west of it, so 25 floors. And then the rest of the neighborhood is zoned up to 11 floors, including um, maybe the, the two properties that the city has the most control over in terms of making sure that we develop, um, which is their properties in front of Everett Station, and then the Cedar Street Everett Public Works site. That's just a little cleaner look. Comparing the two, you can see the X site has a lot more developable capacity in it than the uh, than the uh, option C site. And I'm just throwing this in here for a comparison of um, on the on the right there is the Spring District, and you can see the area that was developed uh, very intensely, uh, all within a half mile of the station uh, for comparison. In addition, the uh, Sound Transit's area, which is in the pink that they're turning into transit-oriented development is also within uh, that quarter mile radius of the station. 
this is really important to think about as uh, the low site um, has 3.8 million gross square feet of developable capacity. That's the red bar here. This chart came from our convergence study published last year. Um, and so it is, has a huge amount of transit-oriented development potential. And the second most would be the Everett Public Works properties with 2.2-ish uh, gross square feet that could be developed. Um, so without building a station closer to the to those station to those areas, you know, we're really potentially limiting our uh, developable uh, properties. Um, I think this is kind of the end here. Um, again, just quick highlight, you know, Broadway alignment, McDougal alignment uh, that curves off and goes into where United Way is. Um, the uh, McDougal alignment that hovers over 32nd Street, which is option B. Option A uh, that comes into uh, the community transit swift bus stop and then option X. So I've tried to kind of summarize what I think are kind of ups and downs potentially of the different sites. Um, and I'm happy to reconsider <laughs> these. And there's really no necessarily value judgment of whether it's good or bad. Um, you know, option D is the closest downtown and there's been a really strong impetus in the past to, to prioritize that. Uh, option A is a long walking distance from downtown. Um, the potential development within a walking distance, um, because option C uh, wipes out so many blocks uh, is the worst. Um, option X probably has the best option there. Any of them could work well with transit connectivity that really depends on the bus uh, routing um, and how that works. I would say option A will leave in place the existing uh, bus bay situation, which is less advantageous for having faster transit connections. Um, uh, the traffic impact, depending on how options you know, how the options on Broadway and McDougal are designed uh, could be really bad. They could be not so bad, uh, depending. Um, but uh, option D has a potential to, you know, really take up some right of way in the street. Um, it also could, you know, help with placemaking on the ground too. If it's taking up additional uh, space on the ground, that could be additional pedestrian space on the ground. So that could be good for people who are walking as opposed to people who are driving. Freight impact, um, you know, I think again, it depends on for McDougal, uh, Broadway, certainly, you know, Broadway is a significant uh, freight street as well, but just uh, operations out of buildings, we would wanna be uh, consider whether the structure impacts uh, getting in and out of building. Um, and then uh, placemaking. So the ability to have, you know, park an open space and activate it. Uh, I, it really depends on the design of the building and what we're able to do on that front. Um, and then on cost, uh, still to be determined on that front too, but um, moving power lines is pretty significant cost, uh, more than one would think. Uh, and the ability to use publicly owned property is a, could be a significant cost savings. Um, so uh, these are just kind of hypothetical pluses and minuses here. So finally, um, I just kind of want to hear from everybody what your thoughts are on these options. Um, is there a consensus or an option that everybody wants to push forward or put our weight behind, if you will? Is that the point of bringing up X? Um, the point of bringing up X is that X will not be considered <laughs> unless somebody asks for it to be considered. Um, the point isn't necessarily that we push that it definitely get built, but for that to be analyzed. That's at least my intent for including it here. Um, again, I think I am hesitant, you know, I'm hesitant to at this point say any one of them is better than the others because we don't have enough information. 
from ESDA, from my perspective for ESDA. That said, you know, I want everyone here to feel empowered with this information to like, if you really feel strongly about one, to go ahead and, and say that using your own individual capacity and letting Sound Transit know that. Uh, but it would be really useful for me to know, like uh, Neil said earlier, like I've been concerned about freight uh, movements on McDougal and Neil was like, no, I think it could actually work uh, for freight movements. So that's a helpful thing for me to know um, moving forward. Um, actually, be, yeah. <laughs> actually, Brock, <laughs> I guess after listening to the comments that Greg made regarding construction times um, and along with all the <clears throat> commercial and industrial manufacturing on McDougal and the freight moving up and down McDougal con pretty constantly all day long, um, I think any of the sites other than McDougal would, would be my vote. So what I'm hearing is we want <laughs> Sound Transit to do a deep dive analysis into the potential impact on freight and yeah. business operations on McDougal. Well, also like you mentioned, yeah. all the, the power lines and everything that run down McDougal, that's a, that would be a huge expense to move all that. Well, on the substation as well, I, yeah, that's, you know, it'll be their easiest pick because, uh, you know, business has only one voice and it's not a, it's not a neighborhood, but, um, it, it uh, I mean, they all impact me. I, I'm, I'm right at the beginning of the, of the yeah. flight. So I, I, uh, I'm going to be affected by all of them, but I, you know, I, I, I'm glad you came back with that Neil because <laughs> at any yeah. given point in time and day, I mean, you can have to wait a couple, three, four minutes for a truck to unload or a truck to back in or whatever it is. And I, I don't know the total, uh, B and O tax and employment tax and all that that's generated by McDougal, but I, I would venture to say that it's a, it would have a big impact to this. Those being lost and or moved would have a pretty large effect on the city. I agree. Yeah. For the YWCA, the the D line, C line, and B line would affect us the most, uh, being on Thirty Third and Broadway. So. I would prefer that, it's hard to say now, but my thought is the A line or X line would be least impactful for all businesses around the area. I agree with that. I, I'm, we're most affected by B and C, but looking at it from a, a really zoomed out view, A and X seem like the least disruptive with the most benefits. So I, I personally would be interested in seeing X being evaluated. I think it'd be great. I, would, I think I would too. That would be a really good option. I concur about X. I would as well. It, it, Brock, the, uh, the, uh, you, you never spoke about the at Pacific and uh, Smith, the old H&L property. You know, by the time this process goes on, there's going to be some units uh, built there. And, um, you know, that really affect would I believe, uh, uh, either uh, C and or specifically um, the B, the C and B would, uh, Am I missing something? Would it uh, have a large effect on that property? Um, I, I think C or B would probably have the most impact on the thrifty supply uh, property owners uh, who happen to be on the line here. Um, and so that that's on McDougal and the station would either be directly across the street or maybe even taking up their building, depending on, on where the station location ends up being. So um, for uh, Groundhog with Joe, uh, sorry, with Joey here on the line, um, you know, the, I think they're pretty in terms of whether their building would be impacted, like be, being taken or being used for it, for the development. I don't think there's any concern with the, the options here and if anything the stations being closer to to that 
this development probably be better uh, in terms of uh, catalyze uh, support from a financial perspective. Um, so either X, B or C probably is great for him for that development and for the residents of that building. Um, and I see Joey came on, so I don't know if you want to add anything there, Joey. Um, I like X. X. X looks good, but it's also the furthest away from the downtown corridor, right? Um, well, For, so I that just... kind of depends. <laughs> uh, A is the furthest by or farthest by far. Um, X could be about the same distance as B from downtown. It kind of depends on, on station, exact station location and design. Um, but X and B would be pretty close. Yeah, so we have a 166 unit project that you know we're working on getting entitled with the city. You know, for me, I don't see any of them. You know, I like McDougal at first, but then you hear about all the, you know, the fees for the utility and, uh, you know, all the commerce, you know, we don't want to be too invasive or upset any of our neighbors. Um, so Brock, it's like, I, you know, I, I think the same thing I've always thought is, you know, I'm open minded just to doing the smartest thing and I, I lean heavily on your opinion. Um. I have a comment uh, <clears throat> about the noise matter. Um, you know, when you see four story elevated tracks um, going across in front of four and five story buildings, you begin to wonder what that impact is gonna be on the residents of those buildings. And uh, we don't have any 11 story buildings yet, but you're projecting significant housing development and residential growth. And the noise uh, factor is gonna become more important over time than even it is today. So I noticed that you do have noise or sound transit does have noise as a consideration for analysis, uh, but it wasn't one of the uh, items that you highlighted with the chart that you put forward. and. Uh, I, th I think uh, some deep dive on the noise factor uh, is going to be valuable as we move forward on this. Are you talking about for the uh, Broadway route, Ed? All of the routes. We need to know what the noise is going to be. So housing, all the different housing options that are going to crop up here uh, can, um, you know, will be affected at some level and we need to understand what that is. I think the one advantage of Broadway, although any of the building owners, I think it, it could mess it up and make it not you know, valid is, is Broadway is already a busy kind of noisy street where all the other streets are kind of chill. So you keep all the activity you know, where all the noise is already. That's just a thought. I mean, you know, like that's probably not my favorite choice, but that's just one pro for Broadway, I would think. And I'm sure there's many cons, like the noise for the existing buildings, et cetera. So just a thought there. Yeah, that's why the, I think the X works so well, because you're putting it right next to train tracks that are already there. The noises are a lot alike. And uh... yeah, it seems less impactful, I agree. There is synergy with that at that existing Everett station. It just it seems like it would be less expensive, um, and, and and just the overall impact. I mean, we're we're really uh, like you said, the thrifty supply uh, buildings potentially having to be uh, replaced by the station. We would obviously be very excited about that. We want to participate in in the growth of uh, of you know the the city moving forward. So. Uh, definitely excited about X. Intrigued by the Broadway piece, uh, like uh, uh, Joe said, where um, you know it's it's a lot noisier already. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm interested in A and X and potentially D. I I think that uh, the teal line, which is line D 
on Broadway, I, I highly suggest we do not do that line. Uh, that would go right past Housing Hope, Compass Health, the new development, a lot of residential units. Um, I'm from New York. And when you live under or near uh, train track, it becomes noisy. It, it, and it is not something that looks pretty at all. If you're looking for something that looks nice, a welcoming city, if you enter there, I just do not think it will look good. If we're talking about aesthetics, I, I don't think the pink line is far from in walking distance in terms of walking distance. I agree, but if you look at the lines at Spring District, I live in Bellevue about half a mile from the Spring District. It looks beautiful. I mean, it's not like, you know, and it's, you know, the noise level, yeah, but it's like these are really modern kind of, it's not as invasive of, as I've seen other transportation projects. I don't know, Brock, you might know more, but it's, uh, I mean, Spring District looks extremely stylish. And I know they're not complete, but, you know, they've yeah, done a lot. Of, I think that. The big distinction there is they were um, the, the 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 rail there is actually basically underground or a cut, there's cut and cover and then it's uh, slightly below ground as it's at the spring district um, and uh, here it would likely be elevated not um, slightly below ground at least the the way at least on Broadway. Well, what about so, how it ties into Broadway and Seattle and Capitol Hill? I mean, they have a major you know, thing right there, right? There's housing all around there, right? Yeah, it's a again, tunnel. It's again as a tunnel. So oh, a tunnel. Uh, okay. the yeah. at Northgate, you know, they put it next to the freeway, and then um, the development is staged. Uh, the initial concept for the development at Northgate, and maybe it'll change, was to put office uh, buildings right next to the station, and then the next layer out is the housing. So that way the offices would be a buffer for sound and visual uh, between the, the freeway and the station and then the rest of the residential development. So it is, you know, I, I think it's possible. That there's lots of places around the world where people live with it and love it. Um, so, uh, but I think it's something that we want to flag and have analyzed and considered. And when we have it all the information come uh, this fall, from the agency, we can take that information and, and pick which station at that point we think is the right one based off right. of all that information. Saying um, all that, I still do like X better. Just <laughs> it's out of, yeah. you know, it's not, it's yeah. not really the center of things. So I agree what, with you Marianne, on that. So uh, given that, what steps do we need to take to make sure X is considered as an option? Well, so one thing that I, this isn't an ESD board meeting exactly but uh i on the third we need to provide comments to the agency or by the third we need to provide comments to the agency my inclination had been just to raise the potential issues we want the the agency to consider uh including considering option x not necessarily you have to do option x but to consider it um and so that would be my that would be my action i think as a next step uh from an esda's perspective um what i I think we should all do <laughs> is go to the online form uh, on the website and then request the agency um, uh, to, and I'm just trying to get the link here, um, do it. And I think you could provide comments either directly via email or use the online form. Uh, I mean, obviously doing an email would be simpler. Um, the way that the form is designed is you can provide comments on the specific options, but it is very difficult to actually propose another option uh, the way that they have designed the comment form. So what you have to do is basically on each of the different stations in, the, in your comment form say, also include a, a station location on the east side of the tracks next to Pacific. Uh, so if you wanna weigh in using the form, I think that'd be the way to do it. Um, just two things before we go here, and we don't have much time left, um, is first, I, I want to uh, gauge kind of the, the temperature of those here on the issue of cost and building on time. So the project is currently underfunded by $600 million. 
um, which is about 10%, I think, of the total project cost. Not undoable within the, the grand scheme of, of sound transit projects of overcoming, but still a major consideration. And for it to be built on uh, affordably at this time, it would be built in 2041 instead of 2037. How big of an issue is building on time for you? Um, Do you, are you really looking forward to the, op, the opportunity of trans-oriented development and, and, and the, you know, making sure development happens? Or are you like, I, I'm mostly concerned about the potential impact to my properties and actually delay is better? Okay, Greg or Brock, that's, uh, you say 2041? Yeah. I don't care, I won't be here. <laughs> Yeah, that's a long ways out, Brock. Uh, yeah. It's over 10 years. Um, yep. you, you know, for me, I would like to see it. Well, obviously, there's a lot of building operators, so I'm sensitive to that. But, you know, I would like to see it as soon as possible. But, yep. you know, still a far way away, right? Yep. Agreed. As soon as possible. Why not? Well, I would I would say this is this. This is a long-term decision, and uh, and I would rather wait, uh, you know, a couple, three, four years, if that's what, what it means, and have it done right, than to, you know, make too many compromises uh, just to gain a few years in a project that's going to be here for a hundred years. I agree with that. Yeah, I don't think time's an issue. I, I, you know, I, they'll just keep moving it out. I mean, we were promised in ST1, ST2, ST3. Now they're waffling. So, I, you know, I, I'm all for it. I think Fred said it well. We need to look uh, for the future because, like Neil, I won't be here. But um, having it done correctly and right is better than a hodgepodge of of, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm not a very strong proponent of them making it to Everett by 2060. <laughs> Sorry, guys. If I would normally know. agree with you, Greg, but just I drive up the five corridor all the time from Bellevue into you know our neighborhood, and like I've just seen just a lot of you know a lot of progress. So you know, and then I live in Bellevue too, and there's like. You know the rails man is it it's an impressive project and they they seem once they execute it you know and get their permits you know they seem to be able to get things done right but it takes forever to get to that level but it seems like you know there you know there's uh, quite a lot of amazing work being done right now on the five corridor well so in this, music, you know in in this vein i'm in uh in danger of bringing up a, a major thorny issue at the end of the meeting uh, I want to raise something that other community groups have brought up and that may have co has cost implications, uh, which is less about our neighborhood and more about the physical alignment from the southern end from Mariner Park and Ride to the north uh, through the Southwest Industrial Center. So I'm going to flip through. So I'm, I just to make sure everybody is fully informed of kind of the of uh, what's at stake here and what others, what other things are happening. Um, so you have this alignment here from Mariner to downtown, but there's this major deviation that comes off. And this has been a major conversation for since uh, the SD3 package has been, was put together. So 2014, 2015, about whether to, to serve uh, Boeing and Painfield. And so, um, one option led by the Connect Casino Road Group that has been pitched is to just do an I-5 alignment directly up um, at, instead of doing the route to, to Boeing and then to serve that area instead with bus rapid transit. And the reason for them, for the Casino Road residents is they're concerned about displacement. Uh, they're fairly low income residents along Casino Road. But, um, you know, there's, there are other things to think about. So here's the alignment here on the, uh, going through the Southwest Industrial Center of their options of A, B, C uh, out there. Um, the, the alignment out there costs something like a, a billion and a half to $2 billion. And it has about 1900 daily riders projected in the SD3 package. 
So it's a serious consideration to, to make, although new ridership numbers do need to be made. Um, and given, you know, we have a $600 million gap, you know, there's a big question there. Um, they have three options that they're looking at, none of which provide direct connections to the, to the area that are supposed to be served. So uh, the closest to Boeing requires a 0.8, no, 0.7 mile walk to the main station and a new bridge across 526, which is not funded. Uh, option C, which is closest to the airport is a 0.8 mile walk. Uh, and uh, none of them have significant TOD potential. And so, you know, th there's a basic question of like, does that alignment make sense for them that, you know, the Connect Casino Road folks are, are raising? Um, the other limitation is that there needs to be an operating and maintenance facility located for all of the trains that are going to be uh, operating. And the primary locations being looked at are in the uh, in that Southwest Everett Industrial Center area. And they potentially would take up a lot of the transit-oriented development area uh, that would be next to the station. So I just wanted to raise this as something that, you know, is coming up through the process as well and is part of the conversation of the Everett Link extension. Um, and that it folks are pushing for an I-5 alignment in order to keep the, the 2037 timeline on, on schedule. Um, and so, yeah, just. Probably a, lot, probably a lot of people pushing for the other one too, so. Yeah, no, obviously uh, County Executive Summers has been a main champion for that route. And there's a lot of political momentum around uh, uh, building the the line to to the airport or actually to Boeing, not so much to the airport, honestly. So with that, I think I can figure out how to stop my, I don't know if I can figure out how to stop my share screen. So we're just going to be on the extra here for a while. I'm happy to, we're right at 131 here. Um, I'm happy to stay on as long as you have questions or comments, um, but I've gone through my presentation. Thank you. Good presentation. Yeah, good. Have we had a conversation or can we have a conversation with the mayor and the county executive to talk about some of the things that 